In this video, we're going to take a look at mechanical behavior of ceramics at a pretty high level, but look at how their structure and processing might affect their mechanical properties. Let's begin by considering some important technical ceramic systems. So this slide summarizes some important technical ceramics. So these are alumina, zirconia, silicon nitride, and silicon carbide. And I summarize here what their fracture toughness is. So we can see that sort of in general for ceramics, we're looking at a fracture toughness on the order of maybe three to eight uh, megapascals per meters to one half. This column is showing the compressive strength of these different materials. And in many cases, we see a pretty large variation in the compressive strength, and that's due to defects and variations in processing. But in each case, the compressive strengths are above five gigapascals. So these are very strong materials, especially when used in compression. We see here the maximum service temperature of these materials. And this is really where ceramics shine because they have very good strength even at elevated temperature. And then this column over here just talks about some of the uses. So alumina is a very widely used technical ceramic. Um, one example, windows and high-speed aircraft. So it can be made transparent. Uh, zirconia, very good toughness even at room temperature. So zirconia is very useful also at, at low temperature. Um, on its own, it needs to essentially be alloyed with other ceramics for high temperature use. Both alumina and zirconia are made through pressing and sintering powders, which are that same oxide to begin with. Silicon nitride, on the other hand, is, is an engineered compound with a different processing route. This is used a lot in engine applications and in places where wear resistance is important. And then the last is silicon carbide. So silicon carbide is incredibly hard and in material science is essentially used as grit paper for polishing metal and other samples as well. This says here also we have the most corrosion resistance of technical ceramics in silicon carbide. So let's take a closer look then at the bonding in ceramics and how that affects ultimately the properties of these materials. So the first point about the bonding of ceramics is that the bonding is either ionic or covalent, or some mix of those. And one thing that we know about covalent bonding is that it is directional, right? So it's not sort of shared electrons, but there's a specific direction in which the atoms are bonded. And in either case, for either of these types of bonding, these are very strong bonds. And so this is part of what makes ceramics so strong. An example of a system which has ionic bonding is sodium chloride. And a second example is magnesium oxide. Examples of materials which have covalent bonding include silicon carbide, which we talked about earlier in this video, and silicon dioxide, or silica. So, as a result of the bonding, as I said before, these are very strong materials. They also have very high elastic moduli. So these materials are very stiff, and this is also a result of the type of bonding which they have. Let's look next at the features of the microstructure of many ceramic materials. So the first microstructural feature to consider is what the crystal structures of ceramics are. And as compared to metal atomic structures, the crystal structures of ceramics are much more complex. And in many cases, they have a multi-atom basis. So instead of having a single type of atom at each lattice site, we end up with multiple atoms of different um, varieties at each atomic site. The second feature of microstructures is that dislocations are much less likely to form in ceramics, 
And this is a result of the stricter bonding conditions. So it's unlikely that that atomic defect can form because the bond requirements can't be satisfied as easily as it can in a metal. In the unlikely event that a dislocation does form in these materials, it's important to know that the dislocations are essentially immobile at room temperature. And this is the reason why ceramics show so little plastic deformation. If the dislocations can't move, plasticity cannot take place. One last point about this is that the idea of close packed planes is different in ceramics because of the multi-atom basis. So this makes it much harder also for dislocations to glide in these materials. So at the microstructural level, we end up with materials that are very brittle and experience little plastic deformation. Let's look next at the ways that ceramics are processed and how that further affects the structure and then the mechanical properties of these materials. There are a number of different ways that ceramics can be processed, but most of them happen in the solid state because ceramics can't really be processed in the liquid state. This is because their melting temperature is too high that it doesn't make sense to process them as liquids. Instead, many ceramics are made from the powder form and are preformed to shape and then densified from there. The first step in these processes is often either compaction or slip casting to start to form the initial shape of the component. From there, a high temperature step is used in order to densify the material. Some examples are sintering, where essentially just a high temperature is applied, hot pressing, where there is a uniaxial load applied at high temperature, and then HIP, which is hot isostatic pressing. And in this case, it's an isostatic pressure that's applied at elevated temperature. So in all of these cases, the high temperature step is in order to densify the microstructure. Depending on the ceramic system, sintering agents are sometimes needed in order to either speed up the densification or to make it go to a greater extent. During ceramic processing, it's not uncommon for defects to result. So things like porosity or cracks or internal stresses. And these, in the end, control the resulting mechanical properties. So let's just take a look at what some of those resulting mechanical properties might be in ceramic materials. So if we end up with pores or cracks in the material, this can lead to early failure in ceramics. So if there are existing cracks, these can lead to cleavage failure, for example, where the crack rapidly grows through the material. If there are pores in the material, those pores can turn into cracks and lead to failure in that way. Ceramics are very crack sensitive, so even if there are small cracks present, those cracks can lead to catastrophic failure. In the end, the strength of a ceramic is determined by the cracks with the lowest failure strength. And so in the next video, we'll talk a little bit about how the strength of ceramics has to be approached from a statistical perspective, but that's due in part to the fact that there only needs to be one catastrophic crack for the material to fail. When any material is loaded in tension, modes one, two, and three of crack growth are operating. However, in compression, only modes two and three are operating. And it's for this reason that ceramics are so much stronger in compression than in tension, because in tension, they, the cracks can open in mode one, and because 
Ceramics are not very resistant to crack growth. Those cracks will grow and the material will fail. So in general, we find that ceramics are about 10 to 15 times stronger in compression than they are in tension.